<laughs> well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to welcome you here this evening, or this afternoon, uh, to our talk. And um, first of all, let's get this right. Now, all right, so we're going to be considering threats, the threats that are to take place from the north, the trillions, the wealth that is in the Middle East, and the triumph that's going to ultimately uh, culminate in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we look out upon the world scene at the moment, I've been overwhelmed over recent weeks of the fulfilment of Bible prophecy that is taking place. Things are beginning to happen so quickly and Christ's return is obviously very near at hand. But first of all, let's take our mind to some of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 21, in the Olivet Prophecy, in verse 25, Christ said this, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity. A word, incidentally, which means no way out. And the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. So he says to us, when we're going to see this, first of all in the sun, moon and stars, and in the chaos of the nations, he says to us, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So it shows to us that the time is near at hand. Now, first of all, just for a moment, I'd like to look at the subject of the stars. Well, in this case, the moon. And it's very interesting, there has been eclipses on each Jewish feast day on seven particular years since the time of Christ. Now, because the Jewish year doesn't coincide with the Gregorian year, our year, that's why you're getting dual dates up there. So the Jewish year matches and, uh, 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 or overlaps some of 162 and some of 163 and so on. Now it's very fascinating. Take the last three of those dates. The fifth one was during the period of the Inquisition, which drove many of the Jews out of Europe, some of them into Britain, into the security of Britain at that time. Then, of course, we come through to a, well, a very significant date, 1948, 1949, the War of Liberation, which established the State of Israel. Then in 1967, which led, of course, to the control of Jerusalem. Here we can see the fulfilment of God's purposes. But what's so exciting is that we're now moving into the eighth of those and we wonder what that's going to bring. So we're to see, aren't we, eclipses on each of the Jewish feast days. And there's apparently what we are to see. When we left to come across here to Britain from Australia, the day we left was Passover, and indeed it was an eclipse. And so we're moving into that time. But remember what that quote said to us. He says, when that's beginning to happen, he said also there will be a state of acute perplexity in the nations. A time of trouble where there's no way out. Well, let's have a look at that. We're looking indeed at our time. And we know, therefore, the time is short. Christ's return is very near. And what should we therefore expect? Well, we're going to be following the words of Daniel for a little while. or well, the principles that we just read a few moments ago. And I believe the exhortation of Daniel is acute. Here was Daniel... Here's Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, near to the time of Daniel's death when he became an old man. And at that time, writing was seen on the wall. At that time, the city of Babylon was under siege. But the king was confident. He was there having a feast. He didn't fear. His walls were so great. But there came this writing and the king's knees struck together in fear as he saw this writing being written on the wall. He didn't know what it meant, so what did he do? He called Daniel. And Daniel chapter 9 says this, acute words. I, Daniel, understood by books, the books of the Bible, the number of the years, 
And he said by Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of the city of Jerusalem. And Daniel said to him, to King Belteshazzar, this is the night, the termination of the 70 years. And that night the city fell. There is the accuracy of the scriptures. There are the accuracies of the prophecies of Daniel, which come right down to our day. And that's what we're going to be considering for a few moments today. You see, early in his life, Daniel was called in to see the king. This time it was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar hadn't been able to sleep. He'd been having a dream and he dreamt of a man made of metals. Gold, silver, brass, iron, iron and clay. But that image was standing on its feet. And what he was told is that the first metal represented the Babylonian. The next metal, the metal that the empire that would take over afterwards, which was the Medo-Persian, and so on. The Grecian, the Roman, right through to our day, the European. And he was told that that must stand again in the latter days, our days. He said that this was said to him by Daniel. But this, let's look at verse 28 for a moment. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known what shall be in the latter days. Then was the iron and the clay broken to pieces together. So it's got to be united, standing as one image, together. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. God will send his son to rule the earth. So that's what this image tells us. This is what it describes to us. So if we put together the territories of those metals, there's the metals represented, and we've got overlaid there in that picture there, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, the Roman, and then the Ten Toes. We have the combined territories represented here. And what does the Bible tell us? It tells us in Daniel chapter 2 that they will be united together as one empire. And in Ezekiel chapter 38, it describes those same territories as united together and finally, invading the Middle East. And that was so neatly shown to us also in Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, which we had read to us only a few moments ago. So we are to see this power united together and invading the Middle East. And that's what we're going to very briefly deal with today. Well, there we had those words from Ezekiel 38. Thus saith the Lord God, and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding on horses and a great company and a mighty army, and thou shalt come against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land, and it shall be in the latter days. That's what we read, didn't we, in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 11. Here's that great invasion of the Middle East. But look where it comes from. It's led by a power coming from the north parts. The north parts. You go through Jerusalem and go north. You can only go so far north. And then you're going south. You pass the North Pole, don't you? As far north as you can go, the last country you can come to is Russia. So we can see, just let's go back for a moment. We are seeing, of course, not mentioned in Daniel 2, but in Ezekiel 38, that this country will unite these countries together as a great empire and invade the Middle East. And so here we have the threat from Russia against the Middle East. It will invade that area. And of course, as we well know, in power at this moment is Mr Putin. And it would seem like that he may well be the leader of this confederacy. We cannot be dogmatic, but it certainly looks that way, and he's acting that way. But you see, Russia 
is indeed a great power because it exports huge amounts of energy to Europe. Here are the pipelines from Russia carrying natural gas and oil into Europe. And here's the dependence on Russia for gas. I've only got gas there, but that will do. Also oil. Some of the countries are utterly dependent upon Russia for oil and natural gas. You know, if you lived in Eastern Europe, about three years ago, the temperature dropped to minus 40 degrees centigrade. You imagine you were living there and you didn't have that natural gas, your very survival would be in jeopardy, wouldn't it? And so you see the Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe, and to some degree Western Europe, is utterly dependent on Russia. But you see, things are changing. Things are changing dramatically. Here's Ukraine. Look at the date. It's going back about, mm, say, 15, 16 months ago. The start of last year. Not this year, last year. And suddenly Ukraine finds massive quantities of shale oil. Here's where it's found it, here and here. Large quantities of oil. Sufficient oil, not just to supply Ukraine, but the whole of Europe. And most of the pipelines from Russia pass through Euro Ukraine. Ukraine. So what happened? Royal Dutch Shell tore over to Ukraine and said, look, we'll exploit it for you. We'll spend $10 billion, give us four years and we'll get it out of the ground. And you can turn off, they didn't say this, but it was implied, you can turn off all these pipelines and pump your gas, your oil, into Europe. And you can be wealthy. What they didn't say is, what about Russia? But you see, things change quickly again. Go six months later, maybe 11 months ago, Ukraine found conventional oil, about 100 million barrels minimum, under the ground. That they can get out in one year, provided everything is working together. And Ukraine, of course, as we know, is in chaos at the moment. And what Ukraine, the article said, Ukraine is working to break the Russian grip on its national energy sector. So look at that date, June the 12th. We're going to come back to that in a moment. So they suddenly found large quantities of normal oil in Russia, in Ukraine. Now, look at Russia. Russia's exports are represented here in this pie graph. The major export Russia has is oil and gas. 65.2% of its revenue comes from oil and natural gas. Really, it's utterly dependent on that for its survival economically. But a few years ago, let's go back for a minute. A few years ago, 1985 to 2003, Iran fought Iraq and they, keep, they kept pumping oil, huge amounts of oil, to pay for their war effort, the Gulf War. And the average price of oil hit $25 a barrel. It's now about $110 a barrel. We'd love it at $25 a barrel. Look at your petrol prices. You could divide them by four, couldn't you, at least. But in those days, somebody suffered from that. It crippled Russia. Utterly crippled Russia. Here's the revenue they gained from their exports at that time. Look at it now. It was ab absolutely crippling to Russia. And they could hardly feed their people. Here's pictures of the people in those days queuing up for a few loaves of bread. Here's a poor pensioner. Nothing left. Imagine living in those circumstances. Queuing up for milk. Nothing. You know, they uh, contacted New Zealand, and I was living in New Zealand in those days, and said, you, you've got plenty of food, export it to, to us in Russia. And the New Zealanders said, well, what will you pay us in? They said, gold. 
Oh, all right. So we sent several shiploads of food to Russia. No gold came back. So we sent ambassadors over there and they said, we haven't got any. We're bankrupt. We've got nothing. Well, they said, we've got to tell our people back in New Zealand we got paid with something. So they sent us a whole lot of cars called Lada cars. And one out of six of those Lada cars, when you started it up, they blew up. They were poorly constructed, bolts were left off, in the sump there were screwdrivers left and all sorts. Nowadays you go over to New Zealand and talk about larder cars, everybody gets a giggle up over these ridiculous cars that came back. Nobody wanted them. They were so poorly made. Russia, people didn't want Russian constructed things. So where was Russia to go? She was economically constrained. She then controlled the Warsaw Pact countries and these countries here. Her, pot, her territory was huge. So what resulted is she retreated. She pulled out of, her, out of these areas millions of soldiers and brought them back to Russia and tried to put them in the industry to make something so they could get some money to buy food to survive. And the Iron Curtain came down. They were pulling them out of Russia about a thousand a day into, uh, uh, out of Ukraine, uh, these countries into Russia at the rate of a thousand a day to try and recover their economy. And so nowadays, of course, because of that, we have Russia the size it is. All right? But now, remember Ukraine has suddenly found oil. Russia is utterly dependent upon it for its exports and its fair economy. So what was Mr Putin to do? Remember that date? June the 12th, they found that conventional oil. June the 16th, he did the largest military uh, manoeuvre ever seen on the Soviet borders since the times of the Soviet days, on the Russian borders since the days of the Soviet days. 160,000 troops and as well as that 5,000 tanks, 130 aircraft and such like and the man who controlled it, Mr Putin he was pointing the gun at Eastern Europe he was warning them you be careful what you do continue to buy our goods or else that's effectively what he did but now come forward now six months later the Economist magazine which is the leading financial magazine of the world I believe on February the 1st brought out an article about Russia and here's a picture and I'm only just going to pick up the pictures here's a depiction of Mr Putin racing to those games that they had up in Russia and they say look at him joyful and all the people thrilled by it and they went through the economy of Russia. And the end of it, they had that depiction. Here he is, racing to the games, and Russia left in utter ruins. Utter ruins. You see, what's been happening since Mr Putin's come to power is he's been trying to curry favour with the people. He's opened 23,500 churches across the whole of Russia that have been closed under the Soviet days, giving the people back what they want, giving them these magnificent games, paying them more, and so on. What's it doing to the economy? They pointed it out. Now the 74% depended on oil and natural gas. He's been closing down industries and changing them to make things for the people and make weapons. And so the dependence on oil and natural gas is higher than it ever was before. He has been, however, as I said before, dominantly trying to keep favour with the people at the same time the biggest rearmament program since the fall of the Soviet days. Russia, the world's biggest energy exporter, is using that oil to prepare for war. To prepare for war. And so she has been stretching forth her tentacles now throughout into the European area. And we want to trace a little of that right now. Consider what's happening here. Russia, as we well know, has gone into Ukraine, hasn't it? 
The outcome of the referendum in Ukraine, he gave it to the people, was never in doubt because many of them abstained from voting. They didn't even want to vote. They knew what was happening. Of course, therefore, Putin got what he wanted. It was a rigged vote, in effect, and he got control of Ukraine. But what's he doing? Well, here's an interesting writer, a key writer in USA, in Canada and USA, and he wrote in the Washington Post about what's going on in Russia, and this is what he said. This is no trivial matter. Ukraine is not just the largest European country. It's the linchpin for Vladimir Putin's dream of a renewed, listen to this, imperial Russia. An empire stretching across Europe. That's his goal. That's his aim. And he's not stopping just there at Ukraine. Consider this area here. Between Poland and Lithuania is a country called Kaliningrad. On some maps they call it just simply Russia. Because when the Iron Curtain came down, it didn't seek independence. It's still controlled by Russia. Russia has been putting into that long-range missiles. It has put into that area 3,500 tanks and five, uh, sorry, 3,500 troops, 500 soldiers, and that, of course, was recorded some months ago. It's probably even more. And Poland is becoming terrified too, like Ukraine. Like Ukraine. Look what Poland is doing. It's so fearful of what's happened, it is suddenly, according to The Economist, gone over to the Arab world and said, listen, we've got to get oil from you. Russia could in a moment cut us off. We could freeze, our economy could ground to a halt. And so what they've done is they've gone to the Arab world and signed up to get oil and gas. Poland can meet its own gas needs entirely, they said. We're going to be able to get it from the Russian world, uh, from the Arab world. It is all set up. But think about this. They're not going to be buying Russian oil either as Ukraine was threatening to do, or looking like going to do. And so the situation is growing by the minute. The pressure on Russia, it's got to act if its economy is going to survive, and it's moving rapidly. Ukraine mobilises its army as the Kremlin ups the ante with a warning to America. Don't you get involved, we can reduce you to radioactive ash. Over the television media, Obama said, back off. Putin, back off. And out in the media came, look out America, we can use nuclear weapons against you. You stay out of this. And so we can see by the minute the threat is growing. Look, here is one of the newspapers, the New Statesman. Look at the date. And this is how they depict the scene in the world. Russia threatening to move into these countries southwards. The threat is growing by the minute. But are we surprised? We should not be surprised for one minute. We should not be surprised because we have that book, Elpis Israel, written 1848, not 1948, over 100 years ago, about 160 years ago. And what did Brother Thomas, Dr Thomas say to us? When Russia makes... It's grand move for the building up of its image empire. Let the reader, that's us, know that the end of all things as is at hand, as, is, as the present constituted is at hand. The long expected but stealthy advent of the King of Israel will be on the eve of becoming a fact. Brethren and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we should be seeing. Time is indeed very short. Christ's return is just around the corner. And so here we see Europe. What do we expect to happen from the Bible as expounded in Elpis Israel? We expect that area of Ukraine to be invaded for sure. But as well as that, we expect, as Brother Thomas says, those future moves of Russia as notable signs of the times. And therefore we expect... Russia to move into Ukraine, control all of Europe, 
moved south into Turkey, finally through Israel, and then, of course into Egypt, and back to Israel to the Battle of Armageddon. And so we can see the movements are happening before our eyes. Things are happening dramatically as we watch. How long have we got? Well, here's an interesting article from Isla Collier, written during the Second World War. At that time, we saw Russia joining up with Germany. Ra Rosh, Magog, as out found in Ezekiel 38, coming together. And we thought then, maybe it would be leading to the Battle of Armageddon. He said, no, no, no. That's not right. He said, the dates indicate to you it's going to be somewhere like this, taking it from AD 755, where Pepin began this, the Holy Roman Empire, dating from that, he brought us through to around about there. He was not dogmatic that that was the coming of the Lord, but he says they are significant times, and we're living in them right now. Right now. How long have we got? Well, you remember we read a moment ago in Daniel 11, that Russia is going to get me the king of the north and then, having controlled much of Eastern Europe, it will move into Turkey with a great many ships and a great force. Turkey threatens to close the Bosporus for the Russian ships. There's the Bosporus. There, that little waterway from the Black Sea through to Mediterranean area. Russian's navy is predominantly in this area. If that was closed... She couldn't move into the Mediterranean, into the world scene, so to speak. And Turkey has said to her, after Ukraine has fought, fallen, you look after the Tatars. And the Tatars are ethnically Turkish people. Mr Ergodin, the Prime Minister of Turkey, or the President of Turkey, said, you look after those Tatars or we will close the Bosporus on you on Russia. And the paper was shocked. Fancy Turkey saying that to Russia. That's provocative. And provocative it is. Because I believe if that was closed, Russia would move. Also on Turkey. And so we can see the drama is building up by the moment. But what do we expect? We expect from our writings that Russia is going to move into Turkey. But remember, Dr. Thomas writing over 140 years ago, what did he say? We have not to wait the advance of the Russian Gog against Constantinople, Eureka. He says he expected Christ's return would be before that time. He was not dogmatic on this, but he did believe from his understanding of the scriptures that that indeed would be the case. And so it's very exciting to watch these events transpiring so coming back to Daniel 11 and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with horsemen and with many ships and shall enter into the countries take Turkey but look what it goes on to say and shall overflow and pass over he will move into the Middle East and ultimately into the area of Israel but Ezekiel 38 says Iran will be an ally of Russia. An ally of Russia. What do we see taking place there at the moment in Iran? The Iranian leaders declares goal, full annihilation of Israel. OK, the date is 2012. But it appears they haven't really changed course. They're still frantically trying to develop nuclear weapons. And so they are determined, it would seem, their prime goal is annihilation of Israel. Their secondary goal, probably, if they could, to conquer country or to destroy countries like America, which they feel, because of its Christian ways and non-Muslim policies, should be destroyed. So here we can see again, Iran could destroy Israel in less than nine minutes. A few years ago, they were talking about the recent development of this missile here which not only could fire from Iran, as Mr Cameron said, it could hit, America, uh, hit Britain. It is a missile that could go into orbit. In fact, it could hit any part of the world. 
And so they're developing frantically their weapons. Iran test fires ballistic missile ahead of neat nuclear talks. Look at the date, early this year. What is she trying to do? Nobody really knows. But Israel feels she is developing weapons. And she has said to Israel repeatedly to destroy Israel. That cannot happen. They're having talks at the moment. Here's some of them meeting together to talk together with the leaders of the Iranians. But this is how Israel sees the deal that's been struck. Step one in the major steps that are needed to control Iran. We all know the Prime Minister of Israel. When this was reported early this year of what decisions had been made at that meeting, here's what the newspaper in Israel described Mr Netanyahu's response. Like as if he went off with an atom bomb. Netanyahu, a little unhappy, I put that in there. He was not happy at all. Not happy at all. But Iran hasn't stopped there. Look at this. Iran, our hands are on the trigger. Look at the date of that. Only March. Iran is on the trigger to destroy Israel. The Revolutionary Guard Air Force Chief stated that publicly. While they're talking peace, they're threatening Israel. And so here we see one of the allies of Russia that's got to join together with Russia and move into the Middle East. And as we saw from Daniel chapter 11, into that holy land, into that glorious land. Or as Ezekiel 38 describes it, as the land of Israel. But what's going to be one of the driving forces? Trillions.